Willkommen in einem anderen Alfrigans video. Oh, welcome to yet another exciting video. This is part 30 of my figure gaming hobby series of videos and today we'll be covering how to create realistic or at least historical playing areas based on terrain found in actual battlefields. Before we can actually determine how to create a realistic playing area, we need to know the scale and size of the playing area that we're dealing with. While it's possible that changing the scale will not affect terrain placement very much, which is what I actually suspect, I'm trying to base this on actual battlefield maps, thus I'll need to know, use a known scale. This is harder than it appears, because while a battle such as Marengo was only one or two kilometres in width, in the beginning stages at least, the fighting raged over an area 5 kilometres wide by almost 10 kilometres deep. You could just depict the first part of the battle, which lasted from 9am to 2pm, or the entire battle, which went to 9pm. Even if you only depict the first part of the battlefield, both sides were feeding forces into the front line from well in the rear. So, if you wanted to put the effort into creating a detailed reinforcement schedule, then yeah, sure, you can certainly do this, but it will take a lot of work. Often, you may be actually better off just basically depicting the entire battlefield and all the placement of the forces that you know and just use movement rules to get your reinforcements to the battlefield. In some battles, the story is even more confusing than Marengo, as this example of the forces at about 9am during the Battle of Holdlinden. Napoleonic battles rarely consisted of both sides lining up for battle and advancing to meet each other as we imagine ancient battles occurred. They more closely resembled modern conflicts where a great deal of manoeuvring occurred before the fighting actually started, and this fighting almost involved defensive features such as towns, streams, hills, and to a lesser extent woods. This affects the scale to be used as we need to consider the whole scope of the battle, not just the specific location where conflict occurred. Saying that, if a player wished to reproduce an individual action within a battle, then the scale story certainly does change a great deal. In this example, we could reproduce the initial Austrian attack against the French in the centre, which consisted of about two to three divisions on each side. This is a viable game, but it's not reproducing the entire battle. Incidentally, most traditional Napoleonic figure gaming is focused on these types of specific action, which could consist of a few divisions to a whole core per side. And as I said before, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But take a look at this playing area. If we looked at the whole playing area, there's an awful lot of towns, forests and roads and streams. If we only look at the piece in the middle, which is the specific action, then we have a very different terrain situation. In fact, most of the terrain is actually clear and it only involves one town at the most. We get a very different game. I'm talking about the entire battle, not just an individual action within a battle. So once we've identified that we're trying to reproduce the entire battlefield, then with very few exceptions, most battles can fit into an area which is nine kilometers by 12 kilometers. Smaller battles such as Marengo can fit into an area half this size, but few battles will require a playing area larger than this, or a, a battlefield larger than this. If the playing area is 3 by 4 feet, then the ground scale will be probably 1 in 10,000. If the playing area is 6 by 8 feet, the ground scale drops to 1 in 5,000. The only difference between these two scales is the smallest terrain feature that you depict. As, the rule, as a rule, no terrain feature should be smaller than an element's width. So if an element is 4 centimetres wide, then at 1 in 10,000 scale, any terrain feature smaller than 400 metres square can be ignored. At 1 5,000, this becomes a 2,000 square metre square, or that's the cutoff at 1 in 5,000. That's really pretty much the only difference between the ground scale and, and actual terrain features placed within ground scale. To begin with, I'll be looking at board gaming maps which fit into the size range which we've identified, identified of which there are several. SBI printed a series of folio games, Napoleon at War, Napoleon's Last Battles and Napoleonic Art of War, provides us with almost a dozen battles to study. One is probably a bit small, such as Marengo, but the rest all fit into our playing area size that I've defined. First battle we'll be covering is Hohenlinden which is not based on an SPI board game, but it's based on a video I created about this battle. This is the original map I based the playing area on. 
This is the map converted into something that you could use to create a figure gaming playing area. There are no hills in the playing areas as most of the hills were actually in the forest and there certainly were some rather steep hills, but the forest pretty much masks all that. The playing area contains 12 small towns, many of which were fought over and were key military objectives. The Grode's main purpose was to negate the terrain features such as woods and streams. Some of these roads were all weather roads and some were not. Thus, you would need to specific specify which was which. To avoid having too many roads, only the all-weather roads could be depicted, with only the bridges being left for the other roads. We'll go back to this map, which we've already seen, but this is the situation during this battle about 9am in the morning. This shows the effect I was referring to, or how important movement was in an actual battle. It was all about getting the most where it was needed as quickly as possible. Two roads were all weather roads, so the movement of two columns were rapid. The other two roads were not all weather roads, and thus the movement was slow. This had a major impact on the actual battle. The French counterattack is shown on the left. That is the French counterattack column. The French defensive line is in the clear terrain up at the top right but is based on three towns, and there were French forces in the forest in front of the position. At this point, the Austrians had pushed them out of the forest, but when the Austrians left the forest, they were hit with a counterattack the French launched with their reserve cavalry. If we look at Marengo, the Marengo battlefield was much smaller, but I've included this as an example regardless. The hill, hills, of which there was only one major and a few minor, gave troops on top of the crest a significant advantage in combat, as did the streams. So they were actually a key defensive terrain feature, which is a little bit unusual to figure gaming, where typically hills don't tend to be so important, for that purpose anyway. Converting it into a template, which I can create a playing area of, which I did and I'll show later. Ignoring the major built-up area on the left, there are 11 smaller towns, many of which were fought over. This shows the initial deployment at Marengo, uh, probably around about 7am, with the Austrians only beginning their crossing of the major river and the French scattered all over the place. The French, in this case, were totally surprised. We'll now look at uh, the Battle of Austerlitz, which is a reasonably large battle and was actually more of a set-piece battle in the vision that we normally have of um, Napoleonic battles, that is two lines all lining up and then people going together at it uh, in a sort of voluntary manner. This is looking at the battlefield from the French side. This is the template which allows me to create a playing area from it. Uh, all I can say is this is very busy with lots of streams. The Russians attacked down the right of the screen where it was met by French reinforcements arriving from the right edge. Napoleon launched his major offensive in the centre of the screen which was the heights which had been evacuated or you know, because of the coalition or allied attack, which was a significant strategic error. This shows the deployment before the allied attack began. The French forces in the line at the bottom right can be placed anywhere behind the red dotted line. In the game, this is secret and only revealed on a later game turn, thus to surprise the allies. As much as possible, elements try and use terrain features to improve their defensive capability. So even though this is probably about the closest to what I would consider is a true set-piece battle, I mean Waterloo possibly is also in that category, uh, there was an awful lot of variability in the battlefield and terrain was used to a large extent. It wasn't simply two lines of infantry lining up in clear terrain and then advancing to meet each other. There was a lot of nuances occurring. Eilau, uh, which was fought in winter, had all the water features frozen, so they actually had no effect. Only the hills, towns and woods have an effect. This is probably the closest that we'll ever get to the flat billiard table concept. And yet even in this battle, an awful lot of the conflict was around heights, that is the heights that you see in the centre, and also the town of Ila. This shows the template, which allows me to create a playing area. I have actually included the river here, but it's frozen and has no effect. The main feature of this battle was the town in the centre, and also the heights directly to its left. 
This shows the deployment of both armies in the afternoon of the 7th, with the main battle occurring on the 8th. This is another interesting point. If you're going to reproduce a battle, many of the later battles actually span several days. And you actually had a situation where players would spend game turns deploying their forces on the first day to actually launch their more set-piece battle in the second day. Now, you could avoid all the manoeuvring up front if you knew the exact deployment of forces on the actual beginning of the battle. But even so, uh, if we look at Eilau here, uh, you still need a fairly large area to depict the battle, even if you do ignore some of the pre-battle manoeuvring. The Inner Alstadus consisted of two separate battles, and this map actually shows these two battles, one on the left and one on the right. Units can move between the battlefields, but must go through the track between the two maps. The whole campaign was fought over an area too large for a single map, thus the dual map effect. Waterloo probably, or the entire Waterloo campaign was similar, but in this case, SPI gave, or in that case, SPI gave us all the individual battles on their own map, which you could join and get the whole campaign. Uh, in this particular campaign, they decided to put everything on a single map. This shows my template, showing both playing areas with a line running down the left of the video. The, uh, in this case, I copied the SPI format and fought both battles on a single 3x4 foot playing area with a piece of dark felt but dividing the two battlefields. I do not generally like this system and probably would prefer having a separate uh, playing area for battle, but in this particular scenario, they are kind of linked. That is, you can actually exit stuff from one battlefield and they will appear on the other battlefield. So I thought this is probably the best way to depict this battle. Um, this shows the um, deployment, uh, the Prussian rearguard at Jena with the French advance guard. The Prussians have not arrived at Austerdat, so are not deployed yet. If we're using a full-size playing area, they would probably be deployed somewhere or not, but this would require a playing area that's four times larger than this, and probably not practical for this particular campaign. Incidentally, uh, SPI gives the Prussians two options. They can decide to stand and fight at um, the, uh, the battlefield on the right and uh, face the entire French force or they can decide to withdraw and have two separate battles. I tend to fight the historical battle. Um, other players may sort of suggest otherwise. Now we go to possibly my favourite battle, Vagram. Um, as you can see here, the uh, battlefield was uh, dominated by a stream with woods on either side, which you can see at the bottom left. Here is the template. The number of roads are quite great. I mean, there are a lot of roads. And if you try to depict these on a figure gaming playing area, you end up with something that looks closer to a work of modern art. Thus, I don't do it. Um, roads are only really useful where they cross streams and negate other terrains. So I actually created this playing area with only a very small number of roads. Actually, the uh, five main roads which cross the stream is pretty much all I depict on here. And I assume there's a road everywhere else. And units can use road movement as long as they meet some conditions uh, from any position to any position. This is deployment. The French have crossed the river and are moving into their attack position with the Austrians beginning to react. The battle spanned more than a single day, but the first day was mainly both armies forming up. Once again, this manoeuvring thing. You could actually start the battle on the second day if you wanted to deploy everything very carefully, but I tend to find it's a lot more interesting if you have the French basically spend the first several game turns on the first day manoeuvring into their attack position, the Austrians reacting. You get a little bit more variety and interest. There is one downside of playing areas this large, um, or when you do this, is there is a lot of movement required with minimal combat. So as long as, you know, you'd have to be prepared to spend the first day just moving around with no combat. But anyway, it's a player choice, and I do prefer doing the manoeuvring up front and then the battle on the second day as occurred historically. Here we have the rather plain-looking Borodino battlefield. The French come from the left side. There is really not much terrain here. However, the Russians did build fortifications, which were the key elements of the game. You can kind of see those three main fortifications in the lower left of the playing area. 
There is a very large river that runs in this battlefield and in the rules you can't actually cross it without a bridge. However, there are many bridges on it, so I'm not quite sure where they made it a river um, and I'm not actually sure what those bridges are. I, su I assume that they're fords. The fortifications are marked with a, a dark dot in the centre. The bulk of the battle occurred in the lower half of the screen. This is uh, the deployment at the critical day. Now, once again, in this particular scenario, um, the uh, SPI allows you to do pre-battle manoeuvring. Actually, you can go back two days and do manoeuvring. Uh, for a bot de no, I actually prefer starting the game at this point because the pre-battle manoeuvring doesn't really add very much or so much to this particular battle. The Russians aren't going to shift from their fortifications or their position, and so then it simply becomes, will the French decide to attack on the left of the river or the right? And attacking on the left is a bit stupid, so, you know, I suspect the manoeuvring in this particular case is not required. But the battle is so large that you still need a very large playing area to depict it regardless. Dresden is a very unusual battle as it was basically an urban conflict. As you can see, the map is dominated by the city of Dresden. This is the playing air te template and gives you a clear view of the terrain the French used and which the Allies had to overcome. The dot that you see in the built-up area represents extra fortification. This is the initial bat deployment before the battle began. The Allies are clearly surrounding the city and the battle is about control of Dresden. To simulate the way the Allies attack, the Allied players can only attack with part of their forces, slowing, you know, with the rest requiring activation in order for them to do stuff. As we know, this was a serious defeat for the Allies, but it's interesting how the battle had evolved or how it worked or how SPI decided to depict it. If both forces think they can win, they are happy fighting in the open. If this is not the case, it ends up being one side in a strong defensive position being attacked by the other, and Dresden certainly was this, until of course Napoleon brought his additional forces and basically kicked Allied butt. Leipzig was probably the largest battle of the war. What is interesting is how the battle can still fit into the same area which smaller battles also fit. Troop density went up rather than the armies being spread out. I'm sure there's some mathematical uh, raison d'etre behind this, but uh, it does actually assist us a great deal. As long as we pick the correct playing area scale, we can pretty much depict all the battles. The only difference is troop density. For Leipzig, uh, you really have to scale the troops down quite a bit in order to uh, avoid ending up with a traffic jam of elements. This is the template, and most of the fighting occurred on the right, lower right of the screen, along the towns that you see in that area. The playing area is also split by a major impassable river, which did have a major effect on the battle. The French, in the end, had to run away off the left flank, and the bulk of their forces were on the right flank, which was the key reason that they experienced such a disaster when the only bridge... Uh, was blown up. This shows the uh, deployment on day one. Uh, this battle raged over four days uh, and there was major fighting on three of those days. This is a long game and the rules allow you to start the battle at one of several key points and ends at several key points uh, before the end of the actual battle. Day one was Napoleon's attempt to defeat the Allies to its front and the other scenarios cover other major events in the battle. The last one is, of course, the final defeat of the French, where the Allies take Leipzig. We now move on to the Napoleon Last Battle Quad. The Last Battle Quad was designed so it could join all four maps together to get a large map covering the entire campaign, which lasted for several days. This is an option and would require players to have a playing area of 6 feet by 8 feet in order to play. It's a project I'm thinking about, but I suspect it's not practical as making these custom playing areas is a big job and I'd need to make a special 6 by 8 foot playing area for just this campaign. This shows the template from Fort Digny, which was one of the two major battles at the first half of the campaign. This shows the deployment and you can see the Prussians are actually in a fairly good defensive position and the French actually have to make a lot of effort to overcome these defensive positions in order to dislodge the Prussians, which of course they did. 
At the same time this battle was raging, that's Ligny, there was also another conflict at Quatrebras. This is the map for that particular conflict. And this is a rather interesting battle because it's about the closest I've ever come across to a true meeting engagement. This shows the playing air template. In order to fit the map into a three by foot playing area, I did not duplicate the entire map. Thus the diagonal road, which you can see on the right, does not line up with the same road on the playing area of Ligny. As I indicated before, all four map sections should actually be able to join together. The playing areas that I've created are smaller than those map sections, so they don't actually join up together, which makes it even more difficult for me to create my big six by eight foot playing area. I actually need to create a special one that will fit the entire four playing areas in it. Another reason why I probably won't do the entire campaign. This shows the deployment, showing the French moving up to take the town, or crossroad, with a minimal British defence. The British arrive in the first few game turns, and this battle is all about the British feeding enough forces in the front line to hold back the French. When I first played this game at a board gaming competition as the British, I was wondering how in the hell was I supposed to survive against the French, but apparently it is possible, although it is rather difficult. Now we come to the main battle, the main battle of Waterloo, which is north of Ligny from memory. This shows the templates. The British were defending yet another crossroad. They seem to have a thing about crossroads. And the main terrain features, apart from some towns, were ridges or slopes, which they used to great effect. This shows the deployment before the battle begin. You can clearly see both sides concentrated their armies. The Prussian forces have not yet entered the battlefield. When playing this game, uh, the front lines do extend out because under these rules, getting around the person's rear, so to speak, uh, gives you a big advantage. So as a result, um, it's something that you like doing. However, there is an awful lot of terrain here which um, uses up a lot of movement points in order to try and outflank the enemy. So it's, you know, it's not a, a rapid expansion of the front line, but it certainly does occur. I think this, this is more of a game system issue than, um, well it is a game system issue of the board game and I think a bit of command control rules um, would probably keep both forces historically concentrated. The last conflict which gets very little coverage indeed is Wavre. The Prussian left one corps to hold back the French follow-up forces while the other three corps moved on to Waterloo to assist the British. The Prussians were outnumbered at least two to one in this battle, so were never going to meet the French in the open. But they did use a major river to good effect. Historically, the French left one corps facing the um, Prussians, uh, which you can see on the left, and, the, and sent another corps down the river to another bridge to cross the bridge and come up and hit the Prussians on the flank, which caused them to withdraw. It worked, and it was a brilliant move, but unfortunately, um, while this was occurring, the French lost the Battle of Waterloo. This shows the template for the playing area, and all I can say is there's an awful lot of terrain here. Now, this is one of the few battles where you're actually forced to cross a major river, which is extremely difficult to cross. The French were on the right, facing the Prussian Corps. They sent a corps down to the uh, left, to another town and another bridge, crossed over and came back up again. Uh, you'll see a lot of swamp, a lot of woods. Uh, this is a comparatively busy playing area. It's not really a very fun game to play, um, so I'm not quite sure if I'm going to bother creating this playing area, but nonetheless, it gives me a, yet again another view of a type of battlefield that was actually a real battlefield, which I can use to determine what my playing area or my ad hoc battlefield should look like. In almost all the battles, someone was clearly attacking and someone was clearly defending. Auschwitz was a bit of the exception, and it was all about forcing or making the Allies attack when it made no sense. But in all the other cases, one side was clearly attacking the other at the start of the battle. In almost every case, the defender was using terrain, either streams, towns or hills. At Austerlitz, the Allies were defending a hill, which apparently gave them such a defensive advantage, Napoleon had to get them off the hill in order for him to win the battle. Hohe Linden, Eilal, Dresden, Leipzig, Quatre Bras were using towns to assist with defence. Bagram and Marengo used streams, which were also used in most of the other battles. 
Marengo, Iina and Waterloo used hills. For Waterloo, it was the reverse slopes. In other cases, it was the top of the hill. In all cases, woods affected the battle to one shape or one extent or another. In summary, in most of the cases, if there was minimal terrain, the results of these battles would have been very difficult. Terrain was the critical equalising factor which gave you a battle. If it was flat and open, the lesser forces would be running as fast as it could. And this certainly did occur, but doesn't make for a game. The other influence that terrain had was to do with manoeuvring. Roads, bridges and other terrain affected how quickly forces to get to where it was needed. In most of the battles, there was a reasonable amount of manoeuvring before the battle. And even in the cases where that was not the case, such as Eilau or Austerlitz, reinforcements arriving from off the playing area was critical. This represents off playing area manoeuvring and terrain has a major effect on the movement of these kind of forces, which do affect your battle. Another factor to consider is the length of um, the battle, or how much daylight there was. Night almost always stopped combat. Thus, even when you are winning, if night fell too early, you could not take full advantage of your victory. There was generally a clear end point to every battle, which was often to do with when was when night fell. In some cases, the battle ended before this point. So at Holinden, the Austrians were defeated and retreating well before night fell. But even here, they were lucky. It was December and darkness helped to minimise the disaster. At Marengo, it was light until 9pm, which magnified the Austrian defeat. Later in the war, good commanders knew that it was better to retreat before your army collapsed. So Charles withdrew in good order after Vagram because he judged his army in too poor a condition. However, he did have night to assist him to give him that breather, allowed him to make the decision, and then to disappear before Napoleon could launch the final crushing blow. Thus, in conclusion, in almost every case, one army must be the attacker, and as such needs to have the strength in order to attack. The defender needs to be the weaker force and needs terrain to help equalise the conflict. The playing area needs to be large enough to allow for important manoeuvring to occur. The final issue is scale. The game needs to allow for an entire battle to be fought with it which within an entire day. There are some exceptions. The Allies attacked at Auschwitz, which was probably foolish as they lacked the strength to succeed. Thus the result. But battles which involve insane errors are really fun to game, as you need to force the errors through special rules or better yet, victory conditions. Otherwise you risk ending up with no action at all. At Austerlitz, if I played at Austerlitz and the victory conditions didn't force me to, to attack as the Allies, I'd just simply sit on my hill. Now let's take a look at the specific terrain features and watch how you should deploy them, how much, etc. First we'll start at built-up areas and we'll look at the density of built-up areas, which for this game system is based on a base width square. So for four centimetre wide bases, a built up area would be made up of four square centimetre bases, as you can see here. Larger built up areas would simply represent these bases joined together. I separate the built up area base from the building to allow the element to occupy or a element to occupy the built up area if required. When unoccupied, I place a building on it for bling purposes only. Incidentally, to avoid these things slipping around, I glue felt on the base of both the built-up area base and the buildings. My terrain is all flocked MD MDF boards or cork tiles, so this sticks like Gore-Tex to the playing area. If you're using a terrain mat, you, you may consider a double-sided tape instead to achieve the same purpose or objective. The amount of built-up area or the built-up area density did vary by region, with Russia and Eastern Europe requiring from 11 to 14 BUA bases or built-up area bases, Poorly developed areas in Central Europe were also light in built-up areas. In Central Europe, we require from 16 to 39 for square centimetre bases, if no major city was involved. If there was a battle around your major city, then the number would rise dramatically. The highest density was in Western Europe or in Belgium, which was a highly developed part of Europe and thus not a surprise. Thus, the built-up area density did depend on the region being fought in. The greater the development, the greater the number of towns. If a major city was involved, you had an increase as well, but this was only in the form of a single large built-up area, and does represent an edge case. There are always exceptions, but if I was creating a terrain placement system, I would determine where it was fought 
and use a D6 to determine the BUA or built up area density with a small chance of possibly a large city or a poorly developed area being fought over. So for example, this chart is a possible built up area density chart determining determine the density of the region the battle is being fought, which in most cases will be medium, and spin a D6. First number is the number of separate towns, the second is the number of four square centimetre bases which make up the towns. Thus if you spun a four you get 34 square centimetre bases and you need to arrange them into 21 separate towns. For simplicity in any manner you wish. As for deployment, that's the hard one. Perhaps each player places a town on the playing area or something along those lines. This is not a rules session and this video is only designed to give players an idea of what they need to consider rather than giving you a definitive answer because quite frankly I don't really know what the correct answer is. I've been struggling with terrain deployment for years. Let's now look at water feature densities. Ignoring lakes or ponds, my water features are either 3-4 cm wide rivers or 1-2 cm wide streams. This shows a 3 cm wide river. In the rules, a river cannot be crossed except at a bridge or ford. A stream can be crossed at a movement cost and attacking over a stream results in the defender being doubled. Water features are my biggest terrain headaches. In this example, it's embedded into the MDF terrain piece. On my cork tiles, it's actually dug out of the cork, painted and filled in with clear silicon. I'm experimenting with Woodland's water-based material, I don't know what it is, instead of clear silicon, as it does give me a much better watery effect. In this example, I normally give the river several coats of a clear varnish to give it an additional glossy effect. In this case, I have not done so, as this was one of my test terrain pieces. The biggest issue is this type of terrain is not flexible and can only be used occasionally, requiring me to create new terrain for different battles, which is not really practical. I'll probably try the WGT Flexi River system, which looks good and does not have the lip that you normally get at the edge of terrain placed on the other terrain. My MDF River versions of this look good from top down, but they have a 3mm lip at their edges, which does kind of detract from the terrain experience. In this example, it's almost invisible. I also like the road system as well, and may try that as well, although these roads are far too wide for my purpose. The material, as far as I can work out, is made up of some type of latex, which is flexible and should sit firmly on flocked terrain surface. I need to try and work out some kind of simple metric to tell me just how much water features exist in each of the playing area. I've divided the water features into rivers, which are in parentheses here, and stream. And the distance that I'm providing is in feet for simplicity. For those in metric countries, such as myself, each foot is 30 centimetres. I've divided water features which run left to right or across the battlefield and front to rear along the battlefield from player edge to player edge. For some battles this is kind of hard to pin down because basically the player edges actually also existed on the flank. So my estimates are that, my gut feel estimate of each battle. Ignoring frozen battlefields, the battlefields range from one, feet of, or one foot of water features to 16 feet. The average seems to be about 10 feet or three meters of water features. This is a lot of water features. While I commonly used to deploy 10 feet of water features on a 6 by 8 foot playing area, normally down a flank, I rarely exceeded 4 feet on a smaller 3 by 4 foot playing area, and these densities are designed for 3 by 4 foot playing areas. While many battlefields are not as nice and neat as we'd like, such as for the gun, where the Austrian player edge runs along the top edge and half each of the flank edges, Let's break up a playing area into flanks and player edges for simplicity. While I often use a water feature to close off a flank, I rarely use a water feature across the playing area. The reasons are complex, but in the world of figure gaming, the idea of two equal forces battling it out on a billiard table in a chess-like manner is strong. Thus a water feature across the playing area would affect this type of scenario a great deal. Basically, it would stop all the fighting. 
If the force mixes were uneven, as occurred at Thrigram, the defender needs terrain to defend, and the idea of a water feature running across the playing area, requiring one player to fight across, becomes viable. Vagram only has about 7 feet of water features, but the biggest water feature is the key element of the entire playing area, so it does have a major impact on play. Next I try to determine the ratio of water features which ran, ran from flank to flank and water features which ran from player edge to player edge. Now I discovered that this does not really vary very much between the battlefields, especially and is mainly influenced on the axis of the playing area, so such as if you're playing across the short axis or the long axis of a playing area. But if it was a square playing area, it seems that the water features tend to be basically evenly divided between those which run across the battlefield or run up and down the battlefield. Thus, on average, on an average square playing area, which I never use, you have five foot of flank to flank water features and you'll probably have five foot of player edge to player edge water features. If playing on a four by three foot playing area or along the long axis, expect six feet player edge to edge and four feet for flank to flank and vice versa. One point which one of my gaming comrades did bring up was many water features play no part in the battle. So for Waterloo, few water features were actually involved. This is a valid argument, but the water features did actually exist. You should consider deploying the correct number of water features even if the play effect is minimal. Because you never know, you may decide as the French to swing out to the right flank, in which case you now have two water features you need to cross in order to outflank the British. My standard playing area would normally have a nice water feature running down the entire flank, which closed off the flank, but which would effectively play no part in the battle. Yet I still had it there because it looked nice. So if the actual battlefield had a water feature, I would strongly advise you to place it. And that would also even apply for ad hoc playing areas. As I kind of emphasised before, I'm not trying to write any rules, and these are just really examples. What I'm really doing is exploring what rules designers may need to consider, or even players. This is a possible water feature deployment table. Two die are thrown, with a result dictating how many feet, or 30 centimetre segments, of water feature segments need to be deployed. 3R6S means 3 feet of river and 6 feet of stream need to be deployed. How these water features are deployed is the real complexity, and I'll, I'll not even begin to cover it in this video. One method could be to allow the attacker to deploy some terrain, and the defender to then deploy another bit of the terrain, and then the attacker to choose the player edge to enter. Some rules go overboard with terrain deployment, which is actually a major issue for play as it affects the time to set up a game. Terrain deployment is not actually a simple thing. You can get it right but then it becomes so complex as to become unusable and you can make it so simple that it results in rather silly terrain being deployed. Now we come to roads. While having a few major roads on your playing area does look nice, placing as many roads as a board game map would make would require would make your playing look like a street directory or a piece of modern art. Roads in the rules have only two effects. They allow units to move across them at a faster rate and they negate the terrain they travel through, which includes water features, woods, rough and slopes. There is a combat effect for attacking across a bridge or up a slope, even if on a road. So, but basically roads do not really affect combat, they only affect movement. As for the rapid movement aspect, how could we depict them without the road? Um, well, if the road network is extensive, then a player could simply assume there is a road everywhere, and as long as there are, they are far enough away from an enemy unit, they can take advantage of whatever road movement happens to represent. If the road network is very sparse, then placing roads on the playing area becomes the viable option, player choice. If we look at uh, the Vergam playing area, we see there are far too many roads to include in the playing area, but I would consider including roads which travel over a river or stream, because that's, that's a fairly significant thing that those roads achieve. This could be a possible road network, which is not really over the top. 
yet covers all the bridges. A player could decide to even minimise this again and only include the uh, two of the bridges or three of the bridges. Some of the bridges in the middle, you don't probably need the roads there, you just need to place the bridges there and forget about the roads. That's entirely up to the player. However, the um, roads that I've depicted here clearly indicate where the, ri ri the river crossings are, which is a good thing. They're not over the top and it kind of looks okay for a player to, to use for aesthetic reasons. I find roads as difficult as water features, in many ways even more difficult than water features. I'm considering these latex roads. The standard width is about two inches, which is far too wide for the scale of gaming I'm involved in. I need roads which are two centimetres wide, but the supplier has indicated they can provide a narrower road, so I may try this option. In the meantime, I either embed the roads in custom terrain pieces or use felt. I do have some brown plastic sheets, which I may give a go as well. I could possibly cut them, paint the top, and probably put felt at the bottom so they stick nicely on my flock-covered playing area. Anyway, it's something to consider in the future. Woods um, gave me the least issue and are probably the simplest terrain feature. I generally use MDF pieces of wood, 3 mil thick, covered with woodland thick foliage and I place a green felt underneath so it sticks to the playing area. Except for one battle fought in a forest, the amount of woods tends to align with what, what most figure gamers would typically use in a playing area. However, how you deploy the woods is a major issue, but it's an issue irrespective of the rules or the density. Marsh or wetlands are not really a common weather feature, but some battles do have it. I generally class this in with my water features and embed it in my water feature terrain. This shows a latex um, sort of wetland area, which looks quite nice, and I may consider getting one of these things. I used to remember when I was young, back in the 90s, playing this, someone had a plastic piece of vomit which they used as marsh. It worked quite well, but did kind of make me feel rather nauseous every time I looked at it. Hills are rather interesting, as in most figure gaming rules, they tend to be all about line of sights. Yes, it's true, in some rules there is some minimal combat effect, but generally it's all about line in sight. In SPI rules, that is board game rules, defending the top of a hill gives you a significant defensive advantage, and I really like the idea. All my hills are flocked pieces of 3mm MDF with a felt base so it stays firmly in place. I normally use felt, which is the same colour as the playing area. This is a test piece of terrain, so I use felt which I had left over from elsewhere, which is why you can see it. The number of hills and their size varied wildly. Marengo has three hills. Two are very small and one is absolutely huge. The SPI rules mainly use the hill crests as defensive advantages. So Waterloo has a lot of hills because the designer wanted to to reflect how the British used hills for defence. Most figure gamers deploy a reasonable number of hills in their games, although a few as large as the hill at Marengo or Vergam. This is only a wild idea, but perhaps if you group woods and hills together and state that on average each 30 square meter square centimetre square contains three terrain pieces or there around, you may be in the ballpark in terms of correct terrain density. Back to an example chart. Once again, I want to emphasize that these are not rules. These are just simply ideas that may make people think about what needs to be done in order to achieve the objective that I'm setting here, which is how many pieces of area terrain do I deploy? Let's say that uh, in this case, each player spins a D6 for each 30 square centimeter or one square foot of terrain to determine how many area terrain pieces will go into it. That is, you can either have each player spinning one d6 and then you cross-reference, or a single player spinning two dice. I'll leave it up to you. Once again, you know, this is an example I want to emphasize, and I haven't extensively tested it yet. And as a result, I'm sure there's some really weird results. But assuming that this is roughly in the ballpark, you could spin your two dice, and if you get a 2s and 1l, that means one small piece of terrain which would be probably a four to six centimetre long area terrain piece, and one large, which would be, let's say, eight to 12 centimetre long terrain piece. The area terrain width would probably be no more than four to six centimetres at the most. The one X in the bottom right is an extra large terrain piece, perhaps a hill or woods, which is 
and you know 16 to 20 square meters in size. This is a rather messy system and you would need a modifier for the number of built up areas in the area as well, but it probably gives you the range of terrain you require. The area terrain would be hills or wood swamp bad game. Perhaps players choose what they wish on an alternative basis in terms of the actual area terrain pieces. As indicated, terrain placement is the true nightmare and I really hate writing rules around it. A possible solution is to create a set of standard playing areas, that is full 3 by 4 foot playing areas, and both players can simply pick which one they wish, or something along those lines, but that still requires you to you know, create a number of standard playing areas. This shows you my custom made Marengo playing area. The issue here is that this requires a lot of custom terrain which um, I need to make and is only really useful for Marengo. But at least in this particular case I don't have to worry about deploying terrain. Now in this particular case the custom terrain I've created or the bulk of it is one extra large hill that you'll see on the left in two pieces and on the right what you'll see is three pieces which is basically the water features. Uh, the rest of the playing area is one of my standard playing areas and as you'll notice the roads don't line up with it which is one of the issues with it. The only other issue with this is that the custom made terrain which I have the rivers on um, are all three mil higher than the the base terrain at the bottom which okay you can say that this isn't really a hill but it unfortunately detracts slightly from the experience. Ideally you'd want to make a 3 by 4 you know, playing area with all the custom terrain on it. But then you've got problems with storage. Um, I've converted about 12 battles uh, using this system. If I created such a terrain feature for each of my battlefields, that's 12, you know, uh, 3 by 4 uh, feet playing areas. Where do I store it? Now, it's true, I, <coughs> I could actually probably double side it, but even so, that, you know, I have to store six very large pieces of terrain. You know, one set of terrain placement rules, which I did like in principle, but I must admit in practice was hard to implement, was the uh, Phil Barker WRG concept of attacker chooses the path of advance and a defender chooses a defensive position on that path. Thus, the line of advance would mainly contain man-made terrain features, towns, roads, etc., with a very low number of hills and maybe a couple of scattered woods, while the flanks would have natural terrain features such as water features, swamps, woods, steep hills, etc. The idea is nice in principle, but it's actually hard to convert into something which allows you to play a game. And it does not seem to align with most of the Napoleonic battles I've covered in this video. Anyway, this is the problem with uh, basic principles. Uh, they sound nice, but when you actually apply them to reality, uh, there's all these messy edges which don't align with your wonderful principle. Anyway, the main conclusions of this video is figure, game, figure gamers need to place more built-up areas which are smaller than those typically deployed by figure gamers. More water features running both flank to flank and player edge to player edge. And I generally think the placement of hills, woods, swamps uh, is generally adequate, uh, but of course how to deploy them are a conundrum and it's a conundrum that would have existed even before I came to the conclusions of this video. So it comes to a close my part 30 player ideas video series in which in this case how to create realistic Napoleon terrain to allow you to refight an entire battle. I have no doubt I have raised many more questions I've answered because at this point I'm even more confused than when I started this video but I suspect all the fun is in the journey and this is certainly a journey that I'm undertaking. Denken Sie daran, immer für Hill und Hamilton zu kämpfen.